Now, let's take this one step further. Let's determine what the expectation of the momentum squared is going to be. So that value, in that case, we're still going to be evaluating between 0 and a, because that's where our wave function is defined. I would still write psi star, but in this case, I'm just going to be writing now that operator squared. And that's what ends up getting sandwiched in between my psi star and my psi dx. And so this way, this may sort of helps show how convenient it is to work with operators in terms of finding expectation values that I can just stick the operator in between, evaluate the operator to everything to the right of it, and then do this integral. So if I explicitly write in all of these terms, I'm going to get p squared x, and that's going to be equal to the integral between 0 and a. I write in psi star root 2 over a sine of n pi x over a. Here I've got my momentum operator squared, which is just, I write explicitly my momentum operator twice, negative i h bar d by dx, negative i h bar d by dx, and then I can write in my psi again. Psi is root 2 over a sine of n pi x over a times dx. Now what I can do is I can take out all of the constants and I can group together some of the like terms. So again, I'm trying to find the expectation value of the momentum in the x direction squared. I have these root 2 over a's, I have these negative ih bars in various places. And right away, I can have this 1 minus sign with this minus sign, so these two minus signs cancel and they become a plus. I have i times i, and so I can multiply those numbers together, and so I'm going to get negative, negative 1, because that's what i squared ends up being. I have a root 2 over a and a root 2 over a, and since they're both constants, I can pull them out front, so I'm going to get 2 over a. I also have an h bar and an h bar. So in the end, I'm going to have 2 over a, or negative 2 over a h bar squared. And then I have my integrals, 0 and a, sine of n pi x over a. I'm going to have d squared by dx squared, because I've got 1d by dx and a second d by dx, so it's essentially take the derivative twice of whatever follows. And what follows is sine n pi x over a dx. All right, so then let's apply this double derivative, this, this double derivative operator to sine n pi x over a. I'll do this on the side just so we can plug that in. But if I take just a single derivative of sine of n pi x over a, then what that gives us is, well, the derivative of the outer function is cosine n pi x over a. And continuing to apply the chain rule, the derivative of the inner function n pi x over a is just n pi over a. And so then if I take the derivative of this guy now, d by dx of n pi over a cosine n pi x over a, that's going to be equal to, well I still have this n pi over a, the derivative of cos is negative sine n pi x over a, Derivative of the inner function, will I get another n pi over a? So in the end, what I'm left with is n squared pi squared over a squared. I have a negative sign, sine of n pi x over a. And so it is just that term is what I'm going to be taking and sticking in for that second derivative that's applied to sine of n pi x over a. We just evaluated it over here on the right. And now I'm just going to write it in explicitly. So I've got expectation value of the momentum in the x direction squared. That's equal to negative 2 h bar squared over a. Still taking the integral between 0 and a. Sine of n pi x over a. And now I'm just going to just plug in what we just determined a second ago. Negative n squared pi squared over a squared. Sine of n pi x over a. I still have my dx that I'm bringing through. 
expectation value of momentum in the x direction squared. And so all I'm going to do now is I'm just going to pull out all of these constants. So I have this negative n squared pi squared over a squared inside my integral. Well, what that means is that my negative signs, they're going to cancel out, so I get pluses. I'm going to have 2 h squared n squared pi squared all divided by a cubed, since I have an a squared inside the integral and I have an a outside the integral. I have still the integral between 0 and a, and here I have a sine n pi x over a, and I have a second sine n pi x over a, and they're just multiplied by each other. So then that's just sine squared n pi x over a times dx. And so now this is simplified to an integral that, that we've already seen many, many, many times. And so when I evaluate that integral, I know that that integral is going to be equal to x over 2 minus the sine of 2n pi x over a, all divided by 4n pi over a, evaluated between 0 and a, all multiplied by 2h bar squared n squared pi squared over a cubed. My next step is to evaluate the bounds of my integral, apply the fundamental theorem of calculus. So again, I'm finding the expectation of the momentum in the x direction squared. I still have this 2 h bar squared n squared pi squared over a cubed. When I plug in for a, I get a over 2 minus the sine of 2 n pi. The a cancels out with the a. And that I'm going to be dividing by 4 n pi over a. I'm going to subtract off. I'm going to sub in now 0 into x, I get 0, and then I'm going to subtract off the sine of 0. And so right away, sine of 0, that's equal to 0, 0 is equal to 0. The sine of 2n pi, well the sine of an integer multiple of 2 pi, that's also going to be equal to 0. So in the end, all I'm left with is expectation value of the momentum in the x direction squared, and that's equal to 2 h bar squared n squared pi squared divided by a cubed, and that's going to be times a over 2. And so what that ends up being equal to in the end is that I can then cancel out the 2's, and I can cancel out one of the a's on the bottom, and so I'm left with h bar squared n squared pi squared over a squared. So one reason why we go to the trouble of calculating the expectation value of a quantity squared is so that we can then eventually calculate the variance and ultimately the standard deviation. So we can calculate the variance as being this difference between the expectation of the momentum squared minus the square of the expectation of the momentum. And so what we're going to do is we're just going to plug in explicitly these two values that we just calculated a second ago. So the variance of the momentum in the x direction, what we just calculated, the expectation of the momentum squared. So I'm going to directly plug in h bar squared n squared pi squared over a over 2. And from that, what I'm going to subtract off is the square of the expectation of the momentum. Well, we just calculated that back up here, when we did this problem, we found that the expectation of the momentum was equal to zero. That means then I'm just going to be writing in explicitly zero. And that means then that the variance in this case is going to be equal to h bar squared n squared pi squared over a squared. Finding the standard deviation from the variance is just taking the square root of the variance. So that means then that the square root of the variance of the momentum, well that just means that I can just drop all the squares and all these values. It's just h n pi, or h bar, sorry, n pi over a. Now what I want to do is I want to multiply this with the standard deviation of the position, meaning we have an uncertainty right now in terms of the uncertainty of how well we can measure the momentum. And in a previous activity, 
we saw that the standard deviation of our knowledge of the position of the particle in a particle in a box, that's equal to a over 2 pi n times the square root of pi squared n squared over 3 minus 2. And so I want to go through this thought experiment of what happens when I multiply these two values together. So if I do that explicitly, what I'm writing is sigma of the momentum times sigma of the position. Well, that's equal to h bar n pi over a. And that I'm multiplying with a over 2 pi n times the square root of pi squared n squared over 3 minus 2. And right away I can cancel out several things. This n pi on top cancels out with this n pi on the bottom. This a on top cancels out this a on the bottom. And so what I'm left with is sigma momentum times sigma of the position. That's equal to h bar over 2 times this square root of pi squared n squared over 3 minus 2. So this next part just takes a little bit of thinking, but I want you to bear with me. We all know that pi is equal to about 3.1415. And so if I square that, then I know that that number is going to be bigger than 9. So that means that this pi squared that's sitting in here, that number is going to be a number bigger than 9. And if I divide that by 3, then I know that a number bigger than 9 divided by 3 will always be bigger than 3, meaning that pi squared divided by 3 will always be bigger than 3. I also know that n is equal to an integer, where it's equal to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And so that, again, if I say n squared times pi squared divided by 3, that number will also be bigger than 3. That means then that this, this square root that we have here, that number will always be bigger than 1. And I know that because, again, I have on this left-hand part of this square root, this part right here, that number will always be bigger than 3, and then I subtract 2 from it, which means I'm always going to have a number bigger than 1, and I take the square root of a number bigger than 1, I still will always have a number that's bigger than 1. The reason why I'm going through this is so that I can now write this final product, where I can basically say, Instead of writing a straight up equal sign, I can now just simply say that the sum of the uncertainty that I know from my momentum times the position that I can know for my particle in a box, that number has to be bigger than h bar over 2. And this should look very familiar, because this is a relationship that looks very much like the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. And so this is one way that we are able to tease out the Heisenberg uncertainty principle by simply just multiplying together the uncertainty with which we can measure the position and the uncertainty that we measure the momentum. And we can see that, yes, there is a fundamental limit um, that is found here that the multiplication of those two values has to be bigger than h bar over 2, meaning that there is a fundamental limit to which I can know I can measure the precision to which I can measure the position and the momentum of my particle. And again, this just falls out naturally from us just analyzing the solutions to the particle in a box. And so this is true for the particle in a box. What we will see a little bit later is how we write these relationships in a more general sense, how we derive Heisenberg uncertainty principles that are going to be based solely on the operators themselves. But we'll see that in a couple of minutes.